Julie is currently the Director of Healthy Imagination at, and Government and NGO Strategy at General Electric. This panel is Electronic Health Records and Web 2.0, Promoting Competition and Choice. We, um, we met Julie when she was with America's Health Insurance Plan. She's also served in the um, Bush Administration Department of Health and Human Services as Senior Advisor to the Secretary of Health and Human Services, also Director of Medicare Outreach. And she um, then moved on to serve as Special Assistant to the President for Economic Policy, the National Economic Council, and now is really working to um, help GE establish itself as a thought leader in the in this incredible incredibly important space and I think a very we all couldn't help but notice on the Olympics I mean if you want to get attention for a new concept and a new healthy imagination and general electric were, were everywhere so Julie if you would um, introduce your panel and I know you have a few remarks as well we're a little bit behind schedule but if we can um, Get our panel started. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Grace Marie. Um, I, I'm going to be really quick because I know we've got people who are um, very much on the ground in the health IT business who I know you all want to hear from. I just wanted to say very quickly, I keep having jobs that um, uh, people can actually laugh about the fact that I got some of these positions. When I became um, a special assistant to the president, you know, that one of the things they do, they send a press release to your hometown and they print it in your hometown newspaper and they call your parents up and have your parents talk to the newspaper, which is always a little embarrassing. But then people write in and they say things like, somebody with the last name of Goon is now a Bush economic advisor. <laughs> Isn't that appropriate? <laughs> And so now I work for GE, an innovation company uh, with a lot going on in health IT, and I bought my first computer in 2005 um, at home. And thankfully, it was a Mac, uh, and, and then I spent the cab ride up here from the office talking to the driver about all the problems caused by GPS and cars now. So uh, <clears throat> I can certainly speak to some of the problems that innovation brings, but the reason I joined GE was because of this Health Imagination Initiative that we launched nearly um, a year ago. Um, GE, uh, to, to David Brailer's point, innovation is alive and well in the private sector. Uh, some of it may be happening outside of the United States. GE has a, a number of research centers around the world, both in uh, Albany, New York, in Shanghai, in Bangalore, India. And part of what healthy innovation is all about is about developing new products uh, using advanced technology for use uh, in countries where those products are actually developed. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that now as well. I think what I'd like to do is introduce the panel um, as each of you come up to speak. Does that make sense? Um, so let me do run through Healthy Imagination real quick, introduce Henry, uh, get down, then introduce Julie, and then introduce Maureen, um, if that works for everybody. Uh, we can go to the next slide just real quickly. Um, GE had done an initiative called Ecoimagination about five or six years ago, which was um, our work to show that you could actually make money by being uh, environmentally inclined. So green is green was the mantra. Healthy was a little bit like that. Um, GE feels that companies like GE, um, large societal issues define our great markets. And so we really wanted to apply our resources and our solutions to some of the issues in the healthcare marketplace. Um, the Health Imagination is a $6 billion investment um, in new technology that is intended to provide cost savings in the system, improve access, and improve um, quality. And we're working with a company called Oxford Analytica in England to validate um, the new products that come out of GE to see that they may meet the standards that have been set for either taking costs out of the system at about a 15% level, improving access, or improving quality at those same percentage amounts. There have been 20 to, there are about 25 validations that have come out in 2009. Um, we're coming up on the first year anniversary and an annual report will be coming out shortly and um, I'm going to go through a couple of those products. But a lot of this has been this, uh, a, a lot of what's gone on at GE has been a focus on review, reverse globalization. So as I mentioned before, we have a number of research centers around the world and they're really developing products for use in those countries, um, in the countries where they're being developed. Um, to really get at technology that is good enough for the situation um, that um, they find themselves in. 
Um, why don't you skip ahead two slides and we'll go to some of these products. Um, a number of them, as I mentioned, are in the health IT space. Uh, we've got asset management systems like Agile Track. We've got electronic medical record systems like Centricity. Uh, we're doing a lot of decision support tools for physicians that are tied to health IT. Uh, in addition, um, you probably, if you saw the ads during the Olympics, you saw the advertisements for the handheld ultrasound machine, uh, the um, uh, V-Scan. Um, that just came out uh, this past year. Uh, the Mac 400 uh, is actually a, a battery operated portable EKG machine that was developed in India for use in places where the um, electronic grid, the energy grid is not quite as, as developed or consistent. Um, we've got lullaby warmers that don't have necessarily all the bells and whistles that people want here in the United States. Uh, uh, MR machines that look at parts of people's body, not the whole body, and um, cost a lot less. Uh, Quiet Care is a home monitoring system that tracks uh, uh, whether people are continuing with their normal movements or not and can alert uh, clinicians if there seems to be a problem in the home. So there's a lot going on in the product development area, but Health Imagination was also intended to involve other parts of GE. Um, including our water division, um, because you can't really be healthy without clean water. So there's a lot of work going on with wastewater treatment. Um, and capital, um, we're figuring out how to uh, loan money to providers, including providers that we had previously not worked with, uh, in order to allow them to take advantage of the stimulus funding for meaningful use technology. Uh, and then we still, uh, the, we still own NBC at the moment, um, although I imagine that you have heard about that as well. Uh, and so we're using NBC to put out a lot of content about healthcare. In particular, they're spending a lot of time on obesity and nutritional literacy. Um, the next slide. Okay, we didn't get the ads. I was going to show a couple of the ads from the Olympics, but I am going to assume that you all saw them. Um, one of them was uh, an ad. Um, called doctors, but it was about electronic medical records and the, uh, the promise that electronic medical records can help a doctor really figure out um, what is going on with a patient without having to over, uh, over test or uh, over treat that patient by um, using their, their past history more effectively. Uh, the ads had a great uh, result uh, from clinicians. 88% of them liked or loved the ads. Um, so they're continuing to run here in this market. And you may actually see uh, outdoor advertising in airports um, around the country as well. Um, we upgraded our website, the healthimagination.com website, to really focus on a lot of the uh, need for additional consumer information in the healthcare space and are doing a number of data visualizations um, to take complex data and show it in a way that makes sense to people. Uh, we got a lot of uh, kudos and use from a number of the members of the physician community for some of the uh, data visualization on the cost of getting sick, for how people die, um, and we've got a number of things coming up, and you can keep checking the Health Imagination website for that. I think uh, the next slide, this, this again just shows that if, and, and I think David spoke a little bit about this as well, in, in the future, as we reach out to consumers, um, they're getting their information from a lot of different places. Um, I mentioned I'm kind of a troglodyte on some of this stuff, but I, I did not realize there are actually YouTube stars. Um, and you can contract with them to do videos for you. <laughs> and they actually, and so we did that. We put out a YouTube challenge, um, and we uh, asked the top-rated stars on YouTube to come up with um, health challenges for their viewers. Um, and so it was a contest. Uh, I think the, uh, the, the one that was people's most favorite inside GE was uh, a, a group called Rhett and Link doing amazing new yoga poses. Uh, but these things in less than a day got 52,000 views and 4,500 comments. So um, I think as we go into the future with innovation, we do have to think about how people are receiving information, especially people in uh, uh, the uh, millennial generation. 
The other part of healthy imagination that we're working towards is um, what we do with our own employees. And so uh, we have we've changed the benefits uh, for people in GE uh, to really focus more on consumer uh, directed health plans, make them better consumers, uh, providing them with the tools like personal health records and a health coach, which I know we're going to hear more about here in a couple minutes from folks on the panel. Um, we are certifying GE sites around the world as health ahead sites where we have gone gotten rid of smoking, uh, that we're populating the cafeterias and the vending machines with more nutrition, tr nutritious food, a lot of focus on prevention and stress management. Um, and we are also looking for opportunities to work with other stakeholders and communities to try and really figure out if working together with hospitals, doctors, and other employers um, and insurers, we can figure out a way to um, bend the cost curve uh, to the extent that that's possible. I know this is a very uh, quick overview of Healthy Imagination, but I know you're also really here to hear our next panel. So I just want to close with saying Healthy Imagination is a new business strategy for GE that reflects the changing needs and emerging opportunities in healthcare. It's a commitment to increase our um, research and development investment in quality, access, and cost, and to bring the full focus of GE on these issues, and a pledge to take on one of the world's toughest challenges, which we, as we all know, that this is one of the world's toughest challenges, and help more people uh, lead healthier and better lives. With that, uh, let me um, introduce Henry Cha, who is president of Healthcare Interactive. Um, he is a healthcare technologist, uh, delivering software as a service to assist companies in managing their healthcare expenditures and provide a simplified and consolidated healthcare experience to their employee members. Uh, as president of Healthcare Interactive, Cha has developed HealthSpace, a common technology platform for developing uh, healthcare applications. Uh, as a leader in the development of healthcare performance management software, Healthcare Interactive uses HealthSpace to support the shared responsibility between plan sponsors, members, and providers in order to manage healthcare risk and cost in a simplified, collaborative environment. And um, I think he is the perfect speaker for this panel, which is focused on connecting uh, patients, clinicians, and insurers uh, through technology. that introduction. Um, it's very interesting that uh, we're, we're, we're in a time when we're getting a lot of information, a lot of data, and uh, in this data we're going to be putting it into lots of different kinds of warehouses, uh, whether you're using uh, Google's platform or Microsoft's platform or, or even platforms like the government will produce uh, on HIEs. At the end of the day, we need applications to run these app, to run, to run on top of these uh, data warehouses to be able to push out and pull uh, action between um, all the uh, what I call a healthcare social network, all the elements, uh, whether it's a plan sponsor, whether it's a member, whether it's a caregiver, to be able to create the kinds of efficiencies that uh, we all yearn for, and that's to improve compliance, that's to decrease costs, and um, ultimately bring, bring about a real change. The only way to do that, I believe, is that we've got to have also an ideological change in how we view uh, social networks. Social networks, there are three elements in a social network that is imperative. Um, and, and these social networks you see everywhere, whether it's Twitter, whether it's uh, eBay, whether it's uh, all these different, I mean, the president actually created his own kind of social network with Obama. Obama's, uh, uh, the BarackObama.com site. Um, the three main components is information transparency. Uh, the content has to be trusted. And, and absolutely, there's got to be empowerment and it's got to be self-correcting meaning the site itself, the social net network itself, must be able to um, create uh, and direct its own uh, 
uh, direction for whether you're a physician, whether you're a member or a plan sponsor. So what I'm going to do today is actually review an application that we had developed for one of our clients. It has uh, three elements. It's on a Web 2.0 uh, technology platform. Uh, it is a application warehouse, meaning we have multiple, multiple vendors into a single platform. Uh, and it is also a development platform, meaning uh, other developers can go on the platform and actually create new kinds of innovation. Uh, and it's not just limited to uh, people like myself and our development team. Um, we're going to review the plan sponsor version called Active Reporting, uh, member employee, uh, the members uh, called the member engagement, and also one for the caregivers. The one thing I've done is um, most people tell me this is a faux pas, that you should never really do this in real time. And I am going to do it in real time and get on the web and show you how, how this works. So as an example, let me go ahead and open up a dashboard that I've logged into. This is our active reporting. Uh, I've gotten, gotten a tremendous amount of information coming from whether it's claims data, health risk assessments, whether it's uh, lab data, etc., and consolidated into a dashboard view. And in, in this particular area, what we have um, are, is a plan sponsor view so that they can, in essence, figure out very quickly what the problems are. You've got to be able to measure, you've got to be able to manage uh, your plan by having information at your fingertips. So uh, one of the things that we've done, done also in here is that we've been able to bring about a dashboard that breaks down specific information by conditions. And as you can see for this particular plan, there are 6,400 members and interestingly, uh, the spend on the medical, about 5.5 million. Um, and interestingly, if you look at then the the active members with chronic health conditions representing a significant number um, of, of dollars on this spend. Why is that important? For this health plan, they're able to go in, they're able to self-direct, they're able to find where their issues are. As you go ahead and add more and more tools to the system, and I'm going to show you uh, a modeler that runs on top of this, it's uh, from Johns Hopkins University, this happens to be the ACG program. It takes and dissects this group and shows you all the elements of where the problems are. Um, in this particular instance, um, let me close this out. In this particular instance, uh, breaking down who is who is at high risk, who is at medium risk. Simple predictive modeling, not it's very simple, but predictive modeling technologies like Hopkins producing you real information about what to look for. And as you go in as a plan sponsor, you have to know um, how to develop better plans specific to your population group. So, so as an example here, we show things like what's happening in this group. In the cardiovascular area, this particular group has high observed per 1,000 or instances of whether it's blood pressure, cholesterol, Comparing that to some kind of baseline, the age, ex age sex expected per 1,000, and giving you numbers on how the health plan is running. Why is that needed? Um, ultimately, for you to control health care, you also have to bring together the members of that health care community. And in particular, whether it's the provider, the caregivers, or whether it's the members, they all must work together with the plan sponsors in order to achieve what we're looking for. I, I've gone ahead, and let me switch back to one more view. In the dashboard view, there's also all kinds of tools that you should expect, things like, you know, what would happen to my spend if I simulated differences um, from a statistical model. This happens to be, as an example of uh, their drug spend. I can separate that out, again, with more information. What if I increased my mail order, what if I increased my generics, etc., and simulating different kinds of viewpoints. Um, again, maximizing or helping to create better efficiencies in the health plan. Um, the action plan here is very important. At the end of the day, if you, if you need to touch the members, um, what we've done is created a communications vehicle for bringing together 
the plan sponsor bringing together the um, members and care providers and we do it in a HIPAA compliant way. So this is a plan sponsor who can actually drive action from the system using health IT. So this happens to be an incentive campaign perhaps. Um, in this campaign um, we, we have a workflow engine that is embedded into the system. In the workflow all of these elements are completed whether you're identifying the incentives themselves, whether you're targeting the members who you're trying to, to target or outreach to, and then driving and creating things like indicators uh, to measure the results of this campaign. So this campaign particular in particular occurred last year. And as an example, we show perhaps what happens from a plan sponsor's perspective if I went ahead and created this campaign, launched it inside my community, and see what happens to the response of the community using incentives and other kinds of plan design issues. Um, let's go ahead and flip this to a member's perspective. Because this is all on the same platform, um, I'm going to show you what a member would see in response to all of these activities. So once a member, this happens to be our member engagement tool. If you look on the left hand side, this is the uh, My Wall. It's basically a communications vehicle to allow all the communications go in and out from the member to the health plan, whether you have caregivers, whether it's the utilization review, the plan sponsor, all the elements. And it can all be tracked and pushed back and forth through simple things like email in a HIPAA compliant way. How do you do that? There's all kinds of uh, tools that we use today, things like tiny URLs. There's all kinds of things to hide the privacy or the private data, but still be able to deep link back into the application so that you can push or give information properly to the member. So in the email alerts, whether it's wall notifications, which is on the left-hand side, appointments, or medication refills, SMS texting, all of these elements of deep linking brings the member back to the specific things that you're looking for the member to partake. Um, on the right-hand side is the tools, and you'll see the calendar, inbox, secure inbox, secure outbox, the claims information about their their utilization, their efficiency. A, uh, another uh, capability of the system is being able to show how efficient a user is. Other kinds of connectivity, other medical re records resources, EMR, PHR, EHR. This happens to be uh, connectivity to Google's EHR. services, health risk assessments, digital health coaches, uh, EAP, employment uh, assistance plans, pre-certification, uh, your medicine cabinet. What about all of the different kind of drugs that you may be taking? And what kind of alternatives do you have to those drugs? This happens to be with our partner Destination Rx, a Medicare Part D partner, creating a trusted source for information. And as you connect these members, at some point, the physician also has to be connected as well. And in our point-to-point -point MD, which we're currently using within the care providers themselves, uh, this happens to be a specific uh, a view of that where you know, we're not here to replicate the patient management system. We're here to lay on top of uh, the EMR and PHR systems. And so in this instance, you would have, uh, the physician would have access to the the predictive model itself for that individual would have other things like how compliant, um, whether it's drug-to-drug -drug interactions, evidence-based medicine, information that is uh, pertinent to how they practice medicine, even the claims information as well as their drug use for that specific member. Again, bringing together all of the information in an application so that uh, the physician as well can be in embedded into this whole process. Um,
The only way we can get to this kind of transparency, this kind of interactivity between all the parties, is that there must be some form of um, health care reform as well in this area of health IT. Um, the main ideological problems that we face today are things like uh, information trans transparency. You know, can we get all the data that we need to be able to achieve this? Um, is the data private? What does that mean uh, from a policy standpoint? How private is private? Um, and trust? Can we trust the sources that bring us information? Can we trust uh, the physicians to be on the system itself to be able to drive this change? And finally, the healthcare social network itself must be empowered. Just like the plan sponsor can drive their own actions and activities, the physicians in this instance, probably more self-explanatory in terms of how they practice medicine, must also be able to drive change and innovation within the system. And finally, the members themselves, can they share? How can they share if there is HIPAA? Is there a way for them to share their best practices and, and the way they do things so that other members can also uh, gain uh, the efficiencies and, and the lower costs that they may have achieved? Thank you, Henry. Um, I'd now like to introduce Julie Klapstein, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Availity, a joint venture between five leading health plans. Um, Availity, and those are Blue Cross Blue Shield of Florida, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Minnesota, Healthcare Service Corporation, Humana, and WellPoint. Um, Availity, the Availity Health Information Network delivers trusted information, uh, administrative, financial, and clinical information supporting both real-time and batch transactions. And because we're running late on time, I'm unfortunately not going to tell you all of Julie's stellar background, uh, but we'll leave it to her to talk about availability. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Okay, a uh, little bit more about Availity. Uh, first slide. Uh, as Julie said, I'm Julie Clapstein, CEO of Availity. I was the first employee in the company, and we are headquartered in Florida, in Jacksonville, and we also, are, also have a major office in Dallas, Texas. Um, the much aligned insurance companies do our, our original investors and continue to be uh, major customers of ours, but we also connect over 150 health plans directly, over 1,100 indirectly to providers throughout the nation. We now have over 60,000 physician offices. That represents about 180,000 physicians on our network and over, we're actually up to about 1,400 hospitals. So we uh, are approaching, uh, I would expect in the next couple of years, about a billion transactions. Uh, we started uh, the company in 2001 exchanging administrative data between providers, uh, mostly small physicians offices as well as hospitals, and a few health plans in real time. We had one-stop shopping, a retail environment really, real-time transactions, meaning the transaction from when they're submitted from the provider to the insurance company, a response is returned in less than five seconds. And as I'm sure most of you know, well over 95% of transactions today on the administrative side are claims, and they're still principally in a batch environment or overnight. So the transactions we started with are commonly referred to as HIPAA transactions, eligibility and benefits checking, claim status, real-time claim submission. But we have also moved into other types of revenue cycle management transactions on the financial side, such as the ability to estimate the patient responsibility before they leave the office and actually transmit payments uh, from the patient. We also have introduced on our network clinical transactions. So we're doing electronic prescribing and we have electronic health records. So we have one-stop shopping, common look and feel, real-time network, um, with very large volumes and very high performance and of course very secure. Our original investors and since then of course we've added uh, the largest for-profit and the largest not-for-profit insurance company to our investors represent 
uh, almost 100 million members now. Next. So we've heard a lot about health information exchange and connectivity. We started with building the platform based on real-time information exchange and administrative transactions. So using that same base and the same connectivity for 60,000 physician's offices to 1,100 plus health plans, we can now also exchange clinical information between providers and plans. We started out with claims data, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that, and since then we are now starting to add other stakeholders and ancillary information vendors such as lab, uh, lab results and so forth. In Florida, where we started, we actually have almost every single physician office, every single hospital that uses that use the Availity Health Information Network on a daily basis. Uh, commonly, they use it for checking eligibility, but they also look at the health records on the patients, and they do electronic prescribing and many other functions on the same network, on the same portal. We've expanded to about 22,000 plus physicians' offices, and as I said, all the hospitals in Florida. So we're doing, taking that approach, which really can be a cookie cutter approach to gaining adoption from the health plans by state, by region, and then moving and getting the adoption for all of the providers and hospitals in the network, again, state by state. So we usually start with the blue plan get them up and using the network and using the function, and then add the other plans. And once we approach that 50 plus percent adoption rate by the plans, we really gain adoption very quickly from the providers. And by the way, it's free to the providers as well. So it's all funded by the plans. <clears throat> Next. The solutions that we've developed are unique in that they're collaborative. So you've got for-profit, not-for-profit, competing health plans all working together on one platform to develop a common look and feel across these applications. And you've all heard of CORE and other uh, new standards in the industry for these transactions. But it's very difficult to really make it easy to use and what these providers often tell us is we're so busy, make it usable for a fourth grader. And so that's a, another thing to do besides just having standards, and I think that's a real key to the collaborative efforts uh, that we have underway. We have to make it easy for the physician as well, or the clinicians won't use our products. So we have to reduce the hassle of paperwork. Our motto is patience, not paperwork. Free to physicians, we're all about adoption. There's such massive savings in this for the health plans, they're saving four to eight dollars on every transaction um, that goes electronically instead of on the phone or by paper. And of course, we save our physicians a lot of time and money. They can do double the work with their patients in half the time, they tell us. So it has to be simple, it has to be self-service. We don't want them on the phone, and they don't want to be on the phone with the health plans or us. <coughs> Uh, we are self-funding. We try to put all the uh, investments back into the company and continuously lower the costs, uh, not only free for providers, but lower for the health plans as well. So the uh, transaction rates continually go down as an industry utility each year. We're about driving cost out of the system. We talked about that earlier. And I think that one of the things I'm excited with the monies flowing to the states and the focus on HIE and meaningful use is we really can get after this cost uh, issue. There are millions and millions of dollars to be saved by automating not just the administrative side of the transactions, but also the clinical side, lowering those uh, medical loss ratios for our health plans. The results uh, speak for themselves. Um, we have a, a lot of very, very happy uh, providers. They can go to one website and deal with all their health plans, just like an ATM, and they don't have to pick up the phone and call them, wait on hold for 30 minutes before they get their information. And it's so important that they know what the patient owes before the patient leaves now. Because, of course, with high deductible plans, 
the patient doesn't just owe $20 uh, copay, they may owe $75 for a visit. So if that patient walks out of the door, between 40 and 60 percent of the money walks out with them if it's not collected at the point of care, like a retail experience. So providers have to start running um, as a business and they need to understand not just what the insurance company owes them over time, but also what the patient owes them while they're in the office. Improved outcomes, again, um, most of them said I can do double the work and can spend time with my patients at half the time using this type of a multi-payer uh, portal that has administrative and clinical information exchanged in real time. And of course the cost savings, again I talked about the plan side, but on the provider side it's two to four dollars. One of the most interesting applications that we've introduced on the network is this ability, the health plans have each and I'll take Florida for a minute, United, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Florida, and Humana at the same time reissued their membership cards. And if you're in the state of Florida, as an example, you would pull out your membership card, depending on who you're with, and it would be a card with a mag stripe on the back. And availability populated card readers in the provider's offices. So these little simple devices, like the one you see on the screen, they present their membership card, and instead of Xeroxing both sides like you do, um, they simply swipe it onto this card reader and it populates all of our screens and populates the benefits information and it even populates their health record if it's available on that particular member. So uh, these are commonly used in Florida and I expect to see these used throughout the country as the other health plans start introducing these cards. Now what I see in the future is they won't just be membership cards. They'll probably be your driver's license. Why not? You know, we're doing those innovative types of things with the airlines and so forth. There's absolutely no reason not to use them in the office. And again, the card doesn't have information on it, just an identifier. So it's not like a smart card. So um, the same card reader in the office can then be used to actually take your Visa card or your debit card or even an HSA card and go ahead, get, collect your payment right then and there and process it in the office. So big time saver, big money saver for the docs. Next. Moving into the clinical area, and I've got one more slide so we'll go quickly. We've been able to take that basic, those basic transactions over our network in real time and expand outside the HIPAA transactions into delivering clinical information. Specifically, in claims data from the plans, we can present that information in a standard CCR format uh, back to the provider onto their desktop or on a portal and present medications history, doctor's office visits, hospital visits, lab orders, lab results, and so forth. And the unique thing about getting that information, starting with health plans, is that doc, or think about an emergency room, may have no information at all about the patient. It might be a new patient. Or even they might have their own EMR, but not that many of them are populated with information. So we can present back that information in terms of an organized health record, which can be downloaded to an EMR that's in the office. So we're really supporting uh, this meaningful use idea by providing more data than they might have about that patient in their own office. We even have history on the patient if they were with a different plan before. So depending on what the health plans will agree to do, we have 18 months to two years of information, even if they've left. And in Florida, Medicaid's joined with this as well. So obviously we have to keep it secure. Thousands of offices are using it, and we intend uh, to offer this uh, throughout the country. We're just now introducing it in Texas and uh, Illinois. And then finally, of course, we are pretty excited about what's going on at the national level in HIT, you know, $50 billion uh, coming to the states. Uh, we want to make sure that we play in the health information exchange area, especially within our core regions, 
But we also want to make sure that whatever monies are collected, that's great, but it has to be sustainable. So it really has to give value to the providers and the hospitals as well as the health plans or even the $50 billion will be wasted and will not be sustainable over the long run. Um, watching this compliance, uh, we, we are trying to be on the leading edge of all of it. Uh, interoperability is what it's all about. That is the hardest part. Uh, I just had a meeting on Friday. We were at Kennedy Space Center. And I was looking, we had uh, John McBride, the astronaut, talking to us. And I was thinking, if they can get a man on the moon in the 60s with virtually no computers, why can't we connect the country <laughs> uh, electronically? And, you know, we can do it. And we've got the money, we've got the emphasis now on it, and we have the great innovation to do it. Uh, quality, obviously, uh, this is something the health plans are highly interested in, preventive care, and we're going to be delivering personalized, secure messages to providers, and they'll also, of course, be doing it to consumers, and uh, this entire area of genetics just has so promising to be able to deliver very customized, personalized um, messages securely over our network and other networks directly to the provider in their office, to the hospital, and to the consumer. So uh, it's excitement, exciting times ahead. I've been in healthcare IT for over 30 years, five different companies, and I believe we in the next five years are really going to make uh, this nation interoperable. We're going to be exchanging uh, health records, not just textual records, but also images. Uh, there's absolutely no reason. All the technology is in place. We just have to uh, agree how to shake hands across the regions and across the country, and we can make it happen. So, thank you. And now we're fortunate to have on our paper a pet panel, uh, Maureen Allen, who is the medical director of Active Health Management with responsibility for a variety of health information technology initiatives. Um, in this role, she is the clinical lead for the development of technology solutions that improve the delivery of health care. Her um, interests include clinical decision support, quality measurement, systems operability, and health information exchange. And she is going to help us figure out how to use clinical analytics that can bend the cost curve and lead to a more accountable care system. Thank you very much. Thank you for that introduction. Um, so what I'd like to do today is to discuss with you sort of the clinical tools that we've developed for point of care for our patients. So Active Health Management is a health is a, is a clinical technology company that is a, that is a, excuse me. So Active Health Management is a clinical technology company that is driven by health health technology management and data analytics. It was founded back in 1998 by Dr. Lonnie Reisman, an entrepreneur. As we talked about today, there are a lot of entrepreneurs in the healthcare arena. And his focus at that point was trying to figure out how does he solve certain problems. So he was concerned at that point about the fragmentation of data. So if you think about your experiences with your doctor, you go to your doctor, he makes an entry in the paper record, he gives you a paper prescription, and he gives you a form to go to the laboratory. And you will now take that form and go to the laboratory, have your tests done, they ask you all your personal data. As you go to the pharmacist, they'll ask you for your personal data again, they'll enter that in their system but none of the systems spoke to each other. And I think we've, we, we face the risk of replicating that today electronically so that data that's entered in an electronic medical record may not speak to any other electronic medical record that exists out there. Dr. Reisman was also concerned about the diffusion of medical knowledge. Um, there's literature out there that says that from the time something is published in a peer-reviewed journal, it takes almost 17 years for it to end up at the bedside where the doctor understands it and the patient understands the need for them to really interact. Today it's a lot faster because now we can go on, you know, on ABC News, you'll hear the latest innovation or the latest um, evidence-based medicine on uh, your local news, so it's actually a lot faster, but there's still a deficit between the time when information comes out and when it gets to your bedside. 
the other concern that Dr. Wiseman had at that time is how, does, how do doctors talk to each other? How do the care team members communicate with each other? And I'm sure you've had experience where you've seen your primary care provider and you've seen your cardiologist or your pulmonologist. And when you get back to your primary care, he says, well, you know, what did your pulmonologist tell you? And you're like, well, didn't he send you the notes? And so how do we actually think about transforming healthcare so that we can start addressing those um, the, the fragmentation of healthcare, so we can start addressing the inability to communicate across the healthcare team, so we can start thinking about putting knowledge at the point of care. We would like to put to you that for accountable quality care, that if we want to get to meaningful use, it's about the integration of the healthcare system. We would like to put to you that through an interoperable health information exchange that you can now start thinking about data acquisition and aggregation to produce a virtual or a realistic, holistic patient medical record that contains all of the patient data. Once you get, sorry, if you go point. So once you get to that point, you can now look at the patient record across the clinical team. You can start thinking about how do we look at patients as a population? How do we impact the quality of care that they receive? Next slide. At Active Health, what we've done is to, as part of um, what we supply, is that we take data in from multiple sources. So we've worked with administrative claims data, we now are working with data from electronic health records, from the pharmacy, from the PBM, and using our embedded analytics within the health information exchange, we're now able to identify gaps in care um, based that will impact the quality of care that the patient receives. And we're also thinking of how do we actually take that information and provide it to the physician at the right time. In order to do that, we have a suite of products that are now available at the bedside of the clinician, so the clinical team using these products can actually deliver care at the time to the patients, um, which is evidence-based. In addition, we have a portal that is, that is patient-facing so that they can see that information, I'll talk about that in a little bit. And we also have a, a quality reporting system that allows the, the, the physician to see how they're performing within their practice and against the other uh, panel of, of physicians um, based upon specific benchmarks. So enhancing the patient engagement. So when you think about the aggregation of data, you've got the entire medical record that's now available. It's a holistic record, it's a fairly complete record. Now you can start thinking about what are the intuitive tools we can put in place that can really empower care, especially at the patient level. So for the patient, we've developed a patient portal and it experientially, experientially influences the patient's ability to engage in their care. So if a patient logs in, we pre-populate it with all the data that we have on them. They can see a list of their conditions, they can see their medications, um, they can see who their health team members are, we can populate that. Alternatively, they can enter that information themselves. Once we have that information, they can now start drilling down this based upon their needs. So they drive how they interact with this tool. We have the ability to connect that tool to a, a health coach. So if the patient wants to communicate with the health coach, either by phone or uh, through email, they can now start talking to a health coach about their condition. In this slide, we're showing um, a patient who has asthma so that they can interact with the health coach to figure out how do I manage my asthma? What is asthma? What does asthma do? Um, they can start looking at specific material related to their asthma. We also do a health risk assessment, so we can use that now to target specific um, issues that might not be rise to the level of, say, an alert, but will impact their care. For example, if this patient says that they're a smoker, then as a health action, they can use this tool to set their goals and how they're going to intervene. So it might be that the patient will say, well, you know, I want to set a goal to stop smoking, um, but I'm going to start with cutting down from two packs a day down to one pack a day. And as they do this, as they document whether or not they've been able to successfully cut back, they can see a health score that tells them how successful they are in terms of managing their condition and disease. In addition, we supply them with trackers, and I think um, for a lot of people that's really beneficial. To looking at a graph that says, you know, how's my lung function doing? I'm tracking that over a daily, day, daily basis. How's my weight doing? Am I losing weight the way I want to? And tracking that on a daily basis to see if they're improving in terms of their care. So our portal for the patient brings all the data that they require in one spot so that they can now be empowered to be um, proactive in their care. 
And then before I uh, leave this page, um, one of the other things I want to bring up as part of what we do is we send alerts and reminders to the patient um, so they can get a, an alert that will tell them, well, you know, um, you're not on a specific medication for your asthma, please talk to your doctor about it, so that they can be more empowered to engage with their physician, engage with the care team member to um, ensure that they get adequate care. Next. Next. On the physician side, we have the same data, but now it's formatted for the physician's view. So at the point of care, the physician can review the patient data. And I think it's really important to understand that this is not his data in his EMR, but this is data that has been aggregated across the health information exchange. So the physician now is able to see data that the cardiologist um, uh, received, that the pulmonologist received, all that data is aggregated and now formatted so the physician at the point of care can see all the tests that were done, all the medications the patient's on. It's also integrated with the patient portal. So if the patient enters data about over-the-counter medications, that now populates the view that the physician is able to see as well. So it brings that whole patient experience, the whole physician experience to one point. I think it's interesting that if you look on this chart, you'll see to the right, there's the care team. And I deliberately headed this slide, clinician, because it's not only about the doctor, but it's about the other members of the team who provide care. So the nurse who's involved with the care, the disease management person, the case manager, anyone who's touching this patient, will have access to information depending upon their role and level of authorization. The physician's able to go in and see a population view. Who are the patients in my, in my office? Who do I see? He's able to look across his population pool at the conditions. So what conditions am I treating? These conditions are stratified based upon risk. So who are my high risk patients? How do I intervene with them? Do I need them to see a disease manager? Do they need to be in a medical home? He can start making decisions based upon evidence-based guidelines that are directly embedded in this tool. In addition, at the point of care, as he steps into that room to see the patient, I know in my days I would you know, open the medical record, have a quick glance and see what's there. There was always this front sheet that would have the diagnosis and the um, medication list. Well, this is replacing that. So at the point of care, the physician can quickly look into the system, see what the patient has as he steps in that room to start, um, start delivering care. In addition, and it's not shown here, we have medical alerts that are sent to them. So the same alerts that we send to patients, we also send to the physician. So the physician will see initially if there are any specific gaps in care that they need to tackle before they get to see that patient. So if you think about the, the information and the data that exists, it's all packaged in such a way that the various members of the team can look, in, look at that information depending upon their role. The other uh, tool that we have and that we've developed is the, is the tool that faces the nurse. So I think if you, for those who, who have looked at what's happened with nurses recently, um, you know, their role as educators to some, to some extent has been lost. And what we've done with the tools that we've developed is to provide them with not only some of this information, but tools that allow them to interact with the patient to provide the education that the patient needs to be empowered to take care of their diseases. So that they have a suite of uh, assessments that are disease driven, so diabetes, asthma, and they use this suite of tools to be able to interact with the patient to provide education and care. The quality manager can log in here and will see a quality report, how many patients in this practice are performing appropriately based upon specific quality managers, management quality measures. Do I need to reach out to a doctor to say to him, oh, by the way, your diabetics, only 30% of them have had the appropriate blood test, and then drive that workflow to ensure it gets done. So when you start to look at it now, each individual who touches this at their point of care, uh, they're able to define their workflow appropriately based upon what they need to, to interact and to, to drive uh, quality. So, you know, I've told you a lot about the tools that we've, we've built, and uh, we are working with the Brooklyn Health Information Exchange and the Borough of Brooklyn to provide this suite of tools to approximately 2.5 million patients. The Brooklyn profile that's given there on the left shows that we have approximately 11% Medicaid patients. 20% um, of the state's uh, Medicaid patients um, are located in Brooklyn and approximately 25% of the city's HIV patients are located, located in Brooklyn. So the concept here is taking the suite of tools, taking our analytics that are embedded in the health information exchange, 
let us provide these projects to, products to the physicians and the patients in that borough. So the physicians through a patient portal will have access to our point of care active care team tools. The patient through our, our patient portal will be able to see their records. And we also have the ability to provide care management to the population specifically. As part of the project, we have a, an advanced medical home uh, pilot project where we're targeting 3,000 people. They will receive a specialized uh, personal health record that uh, targets health, HIV and or geriatrics, depending upon your age, etc. So it's going to be a targeted focus on how do we improve care in this specific population. And we'll be reporting back on the findings. So at the very beginning, my slide uh, talked about bending the cost curve, and I don't know if there are many companies out there that can say this, but we've actually studied this. We've, we've, uh, we have a paper that's out there in the American Journal of Managed Care, the Qualchoice study, that looks at does this technology impact the care that's given, does it impact the cost? And we can say quite categorically that yes, it does. We took a population of uh, 40,000, we randomly uh, controlled, randomized them to uh, receiving the care, the care engine, our analytic tool. Um, so half of the population received that tool and the other half did not. We um, measured what happened over the year and what we were able to show is that those who received the care engine, um, we found that there are approximately 4% errors in terms of care and, and gaps in care. We were able to show that we, were, we could reduce hospitalizations to those who received the care engine, and we were able to show that there was a reduction in the per member per month premium paid out to those who were in the intervention group. On further analysis, we were able to look at the paid versus the charged premiums, and again, we were able to show that reduction, and we found that the reduction was due to decreased utilization, so decreased admissions to the hospital. To the hospital. The other part of the study which was really interesting is that now what happens when you take these two separate populations, the intervention group and the control group, and merge them back and now start to give everybody care considerations. We found that the savings now were found within the initial control group. So across the board, once the, our technology is implemented, we can show that there's a savings for the, um, the, the group that receives care. Um, I think I'd like to end, I'm kind of rushed, um, but I'd like to end by leaving um, uh, you know, what I call the three stools of accountability. I think that there's a need for uh, interoperable health information exchange that facilitates data acquisition and aggregation. I think that there needs to be embedded clinical analytics within that health information exchange, not at the point of care, but actually an exchange that, where all the information has been aggregated. And I also think that there needs to be intuitive point of care tools that are available to the clinicians and to the patients that provides different views into that patient medical record. And before I go, I'd like to just invite you to pick up our handout on uh, Meaningful Use where you can see um, more information about what we do and how we do it. Thank you. Thank you very much. It looks like we're getting the sign from Grace Marie that we have time for one question. Yes, sir. Uh, I um, am part of a 20-man, well, it is man, orthopedic group. And we're in the midst of implementing an electronic medical record. Now, we're not technology adverse because we, we are sharing images with the hospitals, with, with other practices, uh, with radiologists. We're in the middle of working on a health information exchange uh, in, in with a number of other practices in the community. However, our major challenge is at ground zero, and that is the matter of entering data into the electronic medical record. That is, the physician is the primary source of entering, da entering data. Now, the adoption of a tablet PC for, for doing that is a real challenge for many. Uh, and, and they want to maintain their uh, normal dictation habits. Uh, I don't very often get to quote Aristotle, but Aristotle said that uh, uh, excellence is a habit, it's not an act. So that uh, they, many of these doctors have well-established good habits, but the, I, I think as our last speaker said, that we really need to look at 
uh, intuitive point of care tools. Now I'm wondering if GE or some of the other folks are developing natural language processing, which will allow dictation to go to go into searchable fields uh, and 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 populate the electronic medical record in a way that's that's less intrusive in the workflow of practices. I think that's one of the major obstacles to adoption in this country is is that uh, there are the uh, tools for entering the data are, are very, not very intuitive. Uh, thank you for your question. I, I don't know the, that answer with respect to GE, but I will ask the panel um, what uh, is going on in, in the areas that you are familiar with. So I, I think that there are a number of issues that you can think about as you try to tackle that problem. So. You know, one of the things that we do with our tools is that we pre-populate. So there is data that is out there electronically, it already exists, and you can start pre-populating your system with that data and then add to it. There are tra um, electronic uh, transcription tools that exist that allows you to capture the information and have it entered into the electronic ele medical record. It may, may not be structured, which is a big problem, um, I think, when you want to start talking about data and using that data intelligently, but there are tools. But I do recognize and hear what you said. Um, there are a lot of people out there who struggle with this. Um, I think that as we develop the tools, as we start thinking about how do we get that data in, it will get easier. It will certainly get easier. Um, the other thing that you can think about is, um, and what I've seen in other institutions where I've worked, is that the record is scanned in into the electronic medical record. So it provides you with the information but it doesn't provide you with the structured data. You still have to enter at some point the diabetes, the hypertension, so you can start thinking about using that, that data uh, intelligently. Okay, great, great. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, all of the panelists. Um, thank you, Grace Marie, for hosting us, and uh, good luck.